Hey Light Church, Happy New Year's if you're watching this after Sunday, and if not, Happy New Year's Eve. Uh, it's great to be with you guys. Thanks so much for tuning in and praying that as you end 2023 and you enter into 2024, that the God who makes all things new would be speaking to your heart in some beautiful and profound ways. My name is Benji. I'm the pastor here at Light Church, and so thankful that you guys are with us. Just want to let you know a couple of things. Uh, If you're just tuning in for the first time, we gather every Sunday. Uh, We have five different gathering times. We have two in the morning in Encinitas at La Paloma Theater at 9 and 11 a.m. We meet in downtown at 10 a.m. at Luce on Kettner in Little Italy. And then every Sunday evening at our chapel in Encinitas at 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. We'd love for you guys to join us if you'd like. Uh, We have kids ministry at all the services other than our 6 p.m. And we would love for you just to come and join us. Also want to let you know a couple of things. We gather throughout the week in what we call open tables. They're taking a break right now, but at the beginning of February, we're going to be relaunching. So be thinking about what that might look like as you think about your calendar in this next year. Maybe you'd even, maybe you'd even like to host one. Um, and then also all the information of things coming up can be found on our website, lightsandiego.com. Let us know who you are, how we can be praying for you, and we'll hope to see you soon. God bless.
I love New Year's. It's one of my favorite holidays because I need, at least once a year, probably more, an opportunity to look back at the things that happened, to reflect, to give thanks, to lament, to grieve, to have joy. And I love the gift and the opportunity that we serve a God of new beginnings. We serve a God who in the book of Revelation says makes everything new. So there's something about New Year's that feels very holy to me. And as we're winding down 2023, I found myself looking back over the year as a church. Maybe you've been journeying with us the whole year or maybe you're new to the community. But at the beginning of 2023, we came before the church with a vision we believe the Lord put in our heart. And that vision was of a garden that we would take inventory of our own hearts and souls in the same way that you would tend to create a garden, is that we would begin to apply those principles for what the Lord might want to do in the Spirit in our own heart. We had a text that really was our North Star throughout the year, and it comes from John chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the true vine, you are the branches." If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's command and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. This idea of being connected to the vine, abiding, making our home with Jesus so that we may bear fruit, We abide, it says in the text, by obeying His command. And His command is this, to love one another. Meaning, when we live in love, we will fulfill the command of Christ. And when we're walking in obedience to Christ and fulfilling His command, we are remaining in and abiding in Him. And when we do, we bear fruit. That is our prayer for our church, for every individual who's a part of this community, is that we would walk around attached to Jesus and bearing the fruit in His life that He wants us to do. So we use this imagery of a garden. We had different themes throughout the year of what does it look like to cultivate a garden. The first theme is hunger. That why do people plant gardens other than for beauty and to walk in? You plant them to bear fruit, to have food. And so we talked about our hunger is cultivated through prayer. It is that thing in us that drives us towards the divine. It drives us towards wanting conversation with something transcendent. Ultimately, that is fulfilled in Jesus. Secondly, after you have a hunger, 
and you want to plant a garden, you have to till the soil. You have to remove the, the weeds and the rocks. You have to remove the old root systems in order to make the soil rich and ready for the next thing we talked about, which was the seed that was planted in the ground that would bear fruit. This represents the cross, right? As Jesus goes into the ground and does not stay there, but comes back to life and is resurrected. After that, we moved into this idea of new growth. And we went through the epistles the epistle to the Ephesians, this letter that Paul wrote of what does it mean to live in Christ. And then in the fall, we transitioned and this new growth into creating a trellis, some sort of system that actually upholds the growth. And we do that through different rhythms and habits, ultimately culminating what's called a rule of life or a trellis that helps govern your life. And we ended with the idea of wonder. And this is the feeling that we get, the sensation we have in walking in a fully matured, manicured, designed garden, is that we actually get to sit back and wonder. Now, here's the thing about this, though, is this is not just a linear journey. It's a cyclical one. So even as we end our conversation on the garden, may we go back into it. So that's what this sermon is. We're going to be kind of going over at a very high level view of what does it look like for this not just to be something we learned, went through one year, but something we continue to give in. So just a few words on each of these different movements. Number one is hunger. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. Blessed is the one who tastes and sees. There's an appetite. I think one of the greatest prayers we can pray at the beginning of the year is, Lord, will you increase my appetite for you? And would you dull my appetite for the things that do not satisfy? And we do that by cultivating a prayer life, showing up at our prayer room or pre-service prayer or being in your own prayer closet. It's starting this, what the Bible calls an unceasing prayer life, an ongoing conversation with God. Philip Yancey in his book, Prayer <clears throat> Doesn't Make it Any Difference, says, of all the means God could have used, prayer seems the weakest, slipperiest, and easiest to ignore. But He went away in prayer for our sakes as a form of power sharing to invite us into the direct communion with God. This is why in Colossians 4.2 it says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Steadfast in prayer. We're cultivating this hunger and this appetite for God. Or in 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. The author, Brother Lawrence, writes this, There is not in the world a way of life more sweet or more delightful than continual conversation with God. Could we start there? As we start a new year, God, give us a hunger that would lead to a garden. The next thing that we find is that in order to have a spiritual garden flourishing in our life, is we need to pay attention to the soil. For us, last year we spent the season of Lent, leading up to Easter, talking about Genesis through the Exodus, of how we see that the human condition is bent towards rebellion, it's bent towards evil, although there is good and the fingerprints of God in every single one of us, um, I didn't have to train my kids to do something wrong. I didn't have to train them to be rebellious. There's something in them that bends towards that. And it's a parent's job and a community's job to continue to twist the other way to say, no, 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 this is the way of life. And without that, with neglect, with no coaching, no parenting, no love and no nurture, we tend to lean into more destructive and more rebellious patterns. Which is why Albert Einstein once said that what terrifies us is not the explosive force of the atomic bomb, but the power of the wickedness of the human heart. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the famous reformer Martin Luther said that sin is life turned in on itself. So we have to till the soil. We have to be willing to say, God, where are those areas in our life that have been bent on uh, bent away from you, bent towards rebellion. And you might be like, man, that seems kind of extreme. I feel like I'm kind of a good person. But I think when you start to understand the anatomy of sin, what you find is that this is something that's true in every single one of us. It's true in me. James in his book says that each person is tempted when he's been lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, what is fully grown, brings forth death. Michael Card, in his book, A Sacred Sorrow, in talking about the original sin, 
describes it well, where it comes from. He says, It was not simply the bite itself that caused the fall and gave birth to the first groanings of lament from both the creature and the creation. The bite was only a consequent act of disbelief. It was a denial and a doubting of God's hased, which is a Jewish word for faithful love, that led to disbelief that caused the two prodigals to be driven into the wilderness of his absence, never to return. It was bound up with misbelief that God was only the sum of his gifts and no more. All this flowing from the stubborn sin of unbelief. And so you might be like, is sin, is sin really unbelief? And I would say, yes, all sin is ultimately a distrust against God. Ignatius of Loyola says that sin is unwillingness to trust that what God wants from me is only my deepest happiness. So as we start a new year, not only do we want a hunger and an appetite for God, we also have to have an honest conversation of where are the things that have started to take root? What are those kind of big rock things in the soil that need to be removed? Where have things grown calcified and hard? I remember when we planted our, our backyard, the lawn that we have, the hardest work was tilling the soil. I, I rented this huge machine that was way too big for me to handle and I'm just walking around and breaking up the rocks and the soil and then I'm removing these rocks and far more time went into the removing of those things than I did than even in the watering and the planting of a seed. And so I would just encourage you as you move into this new year, are there things that the Lord is saying, those things don't need to be there, those areas of distrust of God's goodness and faithfulness where you're trying to find a shortcut to find pleasure or purpose or security rather than trusting the Lord in it. Would you just surrender those over to the Lord? And you might be like, well, I don't, I don't know how to do that. The beautiful thing is, and then the next movement of this garden is that we move into the power that, the power that is at hand that gives us the ability to do that. And that is the seed that goes into the ground and dies. Remember that sin, when it's full grown, leads to death. But Jesus gave his life to actually take that death for us. John 12, 24 says, Very truly, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone, a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And this is what Jesus lived out. He died in our place. The death that sin brings, he took upon himself. 2 Corinthians 5 talks about how he became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. And then like that kernel of wheat is buried in the ground, but in the burying comes this new life, resurrection, which is our first fruits of what we are all invited into, the life that Jesus gives us of resurrection life. Tony Marita says this, Genesis ends with Joseph's death. Deuteronomy ends with Moses' death. Joshua ends with Joshua's death. But the gospel ends with Jesus' resurrection, and that changes everything. Dr. Russell Moore says, Let us drink, eat, and be merry, for yesterday we were dead. This is the beauty of the resurrection, right? This is part of planting the garden are these seeds of resurrection that not only Jesus planted, but we are invited into as well. I love how D.A. Carson puts it, says, you are not suffering from anything that a good resurrection can't fix. And so would you let, as you, as you hunger for God, as you're made aware of the sin in your life, would you let the seed of his crucifixion and resurrection give birth to new life in you? So what do you do? Maybe for, that, for some of you, this is where you stop and you say, okay, I need to give my life over to, to Jesus. I need his death and resurrection to change me. For those of you who have, what you need to start recognizing is that that new life, like any new plant or new tree, needs nurture and care. Luckily, Paul wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus that gives the instructions on how to do that. And that's what we spent our summer walking through. This beautiful epistle, the crown jewel of all of Paul's letters, to be able to talk through what does it look like to aid and nurture this new growth in Christ. Ephesians 4 Verse 1 is kind of the, the hinge. It, it changes from what Christ has done to now how we live. And Paul says this, As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. That is our invitation last year and this year and every year to come. Would we live a life worthy of the calling that we have received? Would we see the death and resurrection of Christ 
move into a beautiful flourishing of our own life. John McKay, who is the former president of Princeton uh, Seminary, tells that when he was the age of 14, he went to the hills of Scotland and he studied the book of Ephesians and this is where he had his conversion. This is where his new life began. And he writes this, I saw a new world. Everything was new. I had a new outlook, new experience, new attitudes to other people. I loved God. Jesus Christ became the center of everything and I had been quickened. I was really alive. My friends, my prayer, my desire is that as a church community, we would not be a collection of perfect people or moral people. We would be a collection of people who are alive. Alive because of what Christ has done for us. Dead to the sin and mistrust in our life. An appetite for the things that satisfy that are only found in Jesus. And that as we do that, we are left with a really important question. How does that maintain over a lifetime? And the answer to that, which we explored in the fall, is we must engage in forming a trellis. And this is John 15 language. It's a vine. How do vines stay connected? How do branches stay connected to the vine? Well, it's not just this wild shoot. It's structured and organized with the rhythms and the habits. My mentor, Pastor Keith Jenkins, talks about how you don't determine your future. You determine your habits, which determine your future. And so we talked about as a church, what are the spiritual habits and disciplines of Jesus? And how did that invite us into a life that's formed in Him? Romans 12, verse 1 in the message translation says, So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. And so we talked about different rhythms and habits and practices to do. And at the end of that, we had a Sunday where we talked about creating a trellis or as kind of the early church fathers called it, a rule of life. Pete Scazzaro says, A call to order our entire life in such a way that the love of Christ becomes before all else. Nurturing a spiritual life of depth in our present day culture will require a thoughtful, conscious, intentional plan for our spiritual lives. Or how Margaret Gunther says, a good rule of life can set us free to be our true and best selves. Or how Robert Mulholland, we began with this quote, this whole series, that spiritual formation is the process of being formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. And lastly, as a church, we live into the arranging of our lives for the flourishing of our souls and that of others, we are left with the last movement of the garden, which is that of Advent and that of wonder. I mean, have you ever walked around a garden that just takes your breath away? I remember traveling to Ireland a few years ago and we got to go to Blarney Castle and there's these gardens surrounding it and we're walking around and it's probably the closest thing in this world I've ever felt to heaven. It was so breathtakingly beautiful. And that is the result of when our souls become a garden that Jesus says in a parable, it's seed that falls on good soil. And it grows up and it bears fruit a hundredfold. And as we continue to engage in this, we see something beautiful that we live lives of wonder. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, What no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no human mind has ever conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. A quote that we mentioned this year that has continued to stick with me is from the Chronicles of Narnia series. In the book Prince Caspian, C.S. Lewis has this dialogue between Lucy, the young girl, and Aslan, where she goes and says, Aslan, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one, answered he. No, because you are, he says, I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. 
So our prayer is that God would become bigger, not just in our hearts and imaginations, but the way we conduct our lives. Would our souls become a garden, well tended to, de-weeded, new seeds of His crucifixion and resurrection, consistently growing life with the trellis that moves us towards Christ-likeness and spiritual maturity. So just three quick applications for you. Number one, If you have not yet created a rule of life, it's the first week of January. Start one. Don't go into another year haphazardly. Don't go into it not thinking about the different practices and rhythms that are shaping your life. If you need a rule of life worksheet, go under our resource tab on our website, lightsandiego.com, and it's right there. Go to the About section, click Resources, and just follow along. Maybe do it with your roommates or with your family. The second thing is we've just released our next round of Lectio Divina journals. These are journals that give you a scripture reading and walks you through how to engage with them every single day. Would you make it a priority to try and read your Bible four times a week? Why four times? Well, there's a recent study that just came out under Dr. Arnold Cole and Dr. Pamela caldwell Ovio that surveyed 40,000 people from the ages of 8 to 80 of what happens when you read your Bible four to eight times, I'm sorry, four, four to eight times a week, four times a week. And they found nine things. Number one, feelings of loneliness drop 30%. Anger issues drop 32%. Bitterness in relationships drop 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Sex outside of marriage drops 68%. Feelings of spiritual um, stagnant drops 60%. Viewing pornography drops 61%. Sharing your faith jumps 200% and discipling others jumps 230%. So could we as a church, alongside with the Lectio Divina Journal or whatever Bible reading plan you want, could we say we want to feast on the Word of God, not weekly but daily? And the last thing I would just encourage you to do, this is very practical, is would you consider joining or even hosting an open table? Because we were never meant to follow the way of Jesus alone. We are meant to be with Him, to become like Him, as well as to do the things He did largely in the context of community. And so if we choose to commit ourselves to pray, a rule of life, reading scripture, joining in community, I believe that the, the cycle of a flourishing garden can continue to take place, not just for a year, but for years to come. Father, I thank you for a new year. Thank you that you are a God of new beginnings. Would you walk us through and shepherd us through this transition? And I pray that in the next year when we look back, we are closer to you and understanding your nearness to us, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, good.
This is all my hope and peace Nothing but the blood of Jesus This is all my righteousness Nothing but the blood 